Well, welcome back. Until he retired at the end of last year, Ray Winchcombe was synonymous with the management of the deer uh, program here at the Cary Institute, as well as the uh, wide uh, spread use and management of our lands for scientific research and, and uh, wildlife. Uh, native of this area, uh, and spent, what, 37 years on the staff of the Cary Institute, trained as a wildlife biologist. Um, and it, it, I'm particularly pleased to welcome Ray back to talk today because I don't think there's anybody uh, that knows the Institute's lands as well as he does, uh, nor uh, has the experience with managing and watching deer herds uh, the way Ray does. So Ray, welcome back. We'll put your mic up. Anything you could ever imagine or want to know about the impact that deer have on forest ecosystems. Great discussion, um, lots of references. It's a good scientific document. So I'll give you just a second to, to write that down if you like, or we can go back to it later. All right, I'm going to start sort of backwards. I'm going to give you the take home message first, mostly because I don't want to risk putting some of you folks to sleep before I get to the end of my talk. But it's, it's important that people understand that there's a huge amount of information out there that has documented the impacts that deer have to forest ecosystems. So often when people uh, want to discuss, you know, what, they, what can they do to document before they take action, I tell them, just take action. We know what deer do when they're overabundant. So these are some of the things that clearly overabundant deer herds do. They, have, they impact the abundance, distribution, diversity of plants and animal species in the forest. Overbrowsing by deer threatens the survival and perpetuation of our oak-dominated forest. So in addition to the, some of the past, pests and pathogens that you've heard about, you know, deer also uh, provide this risk to our forest. The loss of oaks and the mass they produce would be devastating for a whole host of animals. That's, that rely on these, this resource. And the bottom line is a, a well-focused hunting program can mitigate all these negative effects, but it's something that needs to be put in place with a focus and it has to be continued for the long term. I throw this slide in here because I, it elicits different reactions from different people. And this is the, the worst case scenario of deer overabundance. Uh, depending on where you come from, this is actually a quite nice setup. I mean, people actually enjoy this, this sort of thing. If you're not somebody who is accustomed to natural landscapes, or you're not close with nature, you actually prefer to walk through these kinds of forests as opposed to a forest that looks like this. All this nasty brush gets in the way. Um, you know, people. Like Charlie mentioned, they like to go out to their woods and they, and they uh, clean up the forest. All that nasty brush, we call that habitat for the biologist. And uh, if you're a forest ecologist, it's part of what makes your forest ecosystem work the way it's supposed to. Uh, someone mentioned still grass earlier today. This is complete understory of still grass. We have a closed canopy forest, no seedlings in the understory. When this canopy starts to break up and more light penetrates the forest floor, there are no seedlings to take over to be the next generation for this forest. So this is, this is bad, this is good. So today I want to talk very quickly about life history information about white-tailed deer, in case some of you folks aren't up to speed on that. I'll get into a little bit more detail of, of impacts to forests by deer. Then I want to get into uh, what we've done here over the last 40 years. And then a brief discussion, which we'll probably roll over into the 
a panel later of the role of hunters and landowners in, in managing deer populations. So some of the things you should know about deer, they're the most abundant large herbivore in the United States. They can live a quite a long time in the wild. I mean, it's not unusual to see deer out there at 10 years old or little older. In captivity, they can live quite a bit longer. And unfortunately, some of these older adult females, eight, nine-year-old females, are still giving birth. And they're usually giving birth to at least twins. So uh, their reproductive machine is continuing to move along. Uh, deer exhibit a polygamous breeding system, which is very important when you think about terms of managing the species. Uh, if you're a buck-centric hunting program, you're never going to control your deer population. Uh, most of the breeding takes place before most of your open deer seasons, your firearm deer seasons. Um, you can shoot most of your bucks and never get them all. Whatever's left is just going to have more fun breeding whatever it's not. <laughs> so if you really love your buck population, you know, you want a few guys to have a lot of fun, that's the way to do it. Uh, there's a huge potential for rapid growth. Uh, when you stop managing deer. So it's not something you do for a couple of years and then just, I will skip a few years, we'll come back to it later. And it's important to understand that humans are still the most significant contemporary predator. You can go back historically as well, but humans are the most significant contemporary predator in most areas of deer range. So adult females usually have twins. Now these are deer that are two, two years old, two and a half years old. Um, Triplets are not uncommon. Yearlings often will have a single, uh, single twins are possible. When I say possible, this all depends on the nutritional status of the individual animal. Here in the Northeast, they're on a lower plane than they would be in the Midwest, where the food resources are huge. Well-nourished fawns can breed and produce as a fawn their first year. So a, a, a fawn that's born in June can breed the following fall and give birth to its own fawn on its first birthday. Uh, so that's pretty scary. <laughs> it doesn't happen often here, maybe 5% of the time, but in the Midwest it's 85% of the time. And a single male will breed with as many females as that he can, simple as that. So here's, a, here's some information on a growth experiment that was done when they controlled for all, all, all mortality factors and this was an, ex an exposure uh, where six deer grew to 222 in seven years. All right, so there was no hunting, there was no predators, everything. Uh, they repeated the experiment again, 10 deer grew to 212. So there is this explosive potential for, for deer populations to take off. So this polygamous breeding system issue requires that control efforts be focused on adult females. Um, if control is, your, is something you desire. Now, depending on who you are and what kind of landscape you're, you're managing. Um, if you're, for instance, some of my experiences with, with certain gun clubs, you know, they prefer to manage for more deer. They want to see more deer. And what happens is they sacrifice the habitat and they don't understand long-term long implications of that no matter how often I talk to them about it. So in early deer management efforts, females were protected and we continue to live with the legacy of that. Now, when I first started hunting over 40, 45 years ago, it was very hard to get a permit to take an adult female or take any female there. Um, even to this day, there are people my age or older who continue to refuse to shoot the mother. They just won't do it. And the early goals back then was to restock and allow these populations to rebound. Uh, we don't have that problem anymore. I'm sure most of you know. Uh, now, now the problem is trying to get these deer under control. So let's get into the impacts, and more specifically, um, the, there are several impacts, and I'll get into a little bit more detail on each one of these, but overbrowsed habitats. This is not good for the deer themselves, it's not good for all the other animals, uh, birds, and so forth that live in our forest. Um, it's well documented, if you read that document I, I refer to, uh, you see reduced species diversity, in plants, you see redu redu reduced species diversity in, in animals, amphibians. Um, you have loss of structural diversity. At the first slide I showed you, there was no structural diversity. You had stilt grass or you had canopy. Yeah. There might have been a few rhododendrons thrown in, in, in between there, but there was virtually no, no structure in that forest. You get lost of, of the forest system's functionality. In 
Gary and both uh, Charlie touched on that, where you know, forests you know, stabilize the soil, soils you know, help us with our clean water, and so on and so forth. Nutrient cycling, you know, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Then there's the overall decline in, in deer health and, and the probably the increased possibility of, of rapid disease transmission through these herds. So when resources are very, very tight in overbrowsed landscapes, all these deer are focused in one area, trying to get whatever's left, and that's where these the diseases can quickly move through a deer herd. This is an example of an un unhunted property not far from here, where we put up a, a deer exclosure. Um, and, the, and the growth you're seeing inside this deer exclosure is, took place within five years. So this tells us what the potential of this forest is. Now, if you walk through the rest of this forest, you're going to find the same species out here as in here, but they're all arrested at below your knee level or less. And that's because whenever they stick their head up, a deer nails them. So this forest has lots of potential if they would make the effort to control deer population. They chose not to. What's going to happen, or what I've seen happening here is as some of these canopy trees start to break up, fall apart, we're getting some of the invasives in here. And, and deer are selective on what they eat, and they don't often eat those, so they, they flourish. This is what that landscape looks like in the wintertime. Now, if you care about deer, as I do, as biologists, we always manage deer population numbers to get them through the toughest part of the year, which is the wintertime. So in the fall, you reduce the deer numbers, get them down, so your winter habitat can, can accommodate what you've got left. No one's hungry, nobody starves. And then in the spring, you get you know, new fawns being dropped, and population <coughs> builds itself back up, and then you reduce it again the following fall. That's the natural cycle. I wouldn't want to be a deer wandering around out here in the middle of the winter trying to find something to eat. And you can imagine here as well, put a blanket of snow on this, on this piece of ground, and uh, there's nothing here at all for these deer to survive on. And again, no vertical structure here for other, other animals. So I mentioned deer are selective browsers. They eat what they like the best first and the most. And as a consequence, um, they'll go through and they'll pick out those species and they'll, they'll start to eliminate those species that they prefer the most. So in this particular slide here, you've got the, this is through our browse surveys I do on the property, or I have done the property in the past, and this gives you the, 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 the abundance of, of these species that show up in the survey. And then you look at the browsing rates below, and you can see that you know, red maples consume in a greater abundance than you would expect based on how it appears in the survey in terms of total, total buds available. Oak is available, widely available, it's widely used by deer. Uh, black birch really doesn't show up in high numbers, neither does the black cherry, but they do show up as being consumed at a higher rate than one would expect. Black cherry is kind of an anomaly because most people don't think that deer uh, would eat black cherry or it's not a highly preferred species. But um, on this particular property, it, it coexists mostly in, in what we call wintering areas <coughs> because it's an old field succession with a lot of red cedar, which is good thermal protection for deer and um, not a whole lot other to eat there. So they're either eating woods there and quite often it's black cherry. So the direct effects of overabundant deer is reduced species richness and abundance, again because of their, their habits and how they, how they choose the, the, what they eat. They alter the species composition, so you, you can lose the desired species that you want. I mean, they can easily overbrowse your oaks and your, and your maples, for instance. Uh, sugar maple, for instance, for some reason, um, is a, it's lower on the scale of, pref of preferred foods here, and because our deer populations are lower than most areas, um, we don't see a high browsing rate on our sugar maples here. Uh, but in many cases, you will see you've reduced advanced regeneration. And you have to think of the regeneration as the, as the next forest, that's the next generation. And uh, what you often lose early on are, are a lot of your wildflowers uh, in the understory. And then, of course, the acorn production of or your oak forest supports deer, turkeys, squirrels, chipmunks, mice and on and on, and then the predators that, that prey on those species as well. So if you do have oak dominated forests and you want to perpetuate those forests, you really don't have much choice, but you should be controlling your deer population. 
Now, when I talk about control, I'll talk about hunting a little bit more specifically uh, later, but not all hunting is, is equal or is it equally effective. You really need a program that is very well focused uh, and controlled in terms of getting the hunters to do what you want them to do. Um, right now in New York State, you've got your bio, the hunting license. They give you a tag to shoot a buck. What they should be doing is giving you a tag to shoot a duck. You have to, you have to apply for that. You have to pay for that. I mean, it's kind of backwards. They should give you both. Hunters want to shoot bucks. I have no problem with that. But you shouldn't have to go through extra hoops to actually help exercise ecosystem protection. Um, this particular uh, slide here, this, this is a property that's been hunted far longer than, than our property. And it just looks terrible. And it's looked that way for, for the 30 years I've walked through that property. Um, they kill a lot of deer, but they're not killing a lot of ducks. So that's, that's one of the problems. So some of the indirect effects of overbrowsing, uh, you get this proliferation of undesirables uh, and browse resistant species. You start seeing the understory getting uh, filled in right now around here with hay and fern, New York fern. You see beech, beech survives, deer don't really eat beech, they don't like beech. Striped maple is something that they'll eat, but it's usually something that they won't go for until the very end. Uh, this leads to a shift in balance between native and introduced species, because you get things like Atlantis that come in. Um, deer aren't going to eat a lot of Atlantis, they'll eat some of it. Um, but it, the, the scary part, it can shift the, the, the trajectory of your forest away from the species that you want, if you're, whether it's going to be for wildlife habitat or whether you're somebody trying to grow trees for timber or for what other, what other purpose. Um, then, of course, there's a reduced abundance of forest-dwelling animals. There's direct competition for smaller, smaller uh, pile of acorns, for instance. Uh, so here's an example of, again, this, this other property that where they do hunt, and they've been hunting for years. And uh, you can see there's a lot of light hitting the ground floor here. And in some parts of this property, you will see, if you dig down in here, you, you will find quite a few uh, chestnut oak seedlings, for instance. But once they get above the fern level, they get nailed. And, and now the ferns are competing for those resources that those seedlings need to get them moving and getting, get them up out of, outside of deer range. Um, I've recommended to these folks, for instance, to start building some uh, temporary deer disclosures. You know, it doesn't matter. Whatever you can afford, get some of that flexi net, start, start fencing in some areas. Because in, in two, three years, four years, you're going to see enormous change in, in the and the growth of those seedlings. So the impacts of structural component loss. So this is where we get into a lot of the other species. Um, again, if you don't have that vertical component, that, that component of the forest you know, provides nesting areas, provides escape cover, provides food, provides all kinds of resources needed by a whole host of other species. So when you ignore, or choose to ignore, or if, if you're not managing deer at a level that's being uh, successful in terms of protecting your forest, you're really impacting an awful lot of other species. So again, try to, try to imagine you know, all those animals that need that vertical structure uh, to survive in this forest. Uh, there's, not, there's not a whole lot there. So. So in addition to uh, those animals, for instance, uh, there's also shifts in the microclimate in, in a lot of these forests. Because uh, you're getting increased light, you're getting higher wind, you're getting lower, lower humidity levels, and now you're impacting things like amphibians, um, frogs, that sort of thing. And your vernal pools, whether or not you know, you're having an impact on vernal pools, are they drying up sooner? Uh, we don't really know that answer yet. But um, there is a lot of negative impacts to opening up the forest like uh, like that. In, ad in addition to, I mean, deer are their own worst enemy in terms of destroying their own habitat. So uh, what happens is they will overbrowse and then come wintertime, you know, they're going to be moving into the neighborhoods, into your backyard. 
and you, I'm sure most of you have seen a lot more fencing around people's foundation plantings and their, their gardens than you care to. Uh, this uh, particular, in this neighborhood, I drove around these neighborhoods after walking through their forests, and I would say probably every third piece of property had an eight foot fence around their property. They really, they really look terrible. But that's the only way they can protect their plantings. All right, as far as the deer management program here, it's a program that's been in place uh, since the early 70s. I got involved in 1973 as a hunter, actually, and I came to work here in 1976 as part of the management uh, of that program. Um, before I get into the specifics of our program, these are typically what you would hear or discuss with people when they talk about what are the options for deer management. And this list has been around for a long time. You know, allow nature to take its course. Um, there's a couple ways you could look at that. That could be the ostrich approach to deer management. You know, stick your head in the sand, pretend it doesn't happen. Or wait for wait for deer season to end, and then pull your head out of the sand. What people don't often mention, though, when they talk about allow nature to take its course, is they they take out the human aspect and the fact, the historical fact that humans have been hunting deer and using deer as a resource as far back as you can imagine. Uh, trap and transfer of excess deer, people have tried this. Um, moving deer around is very high mortality rates when you do that, up near 70-75%. So you, you're just killing deer in a different way if you do that. It's very expensive and it's a very localized solution to a problem, if it's a solution at all. Uh, the use of fertility control agents to regulate herd size, that's the latest and the greatest. There's still a lot of issues with that. Uh, inoculating deer with different products that end up in the food chain is a big issue. Um, the last I knew that deer have to have to get a booster shot after you, after you inoculate them the first time. So now how are you going to tell who was inoculated who wasn't unless you tag these animals? You're talking a huge amount of expense. And again, you're talking about effectiveness on a very, very localized level. In fact, the, the couple of studies that happened in New York, um, after a lot of time and effort, um, they basically decided that you, they couldn't capture and inoculate enough does to affect the growth of the population. So we're not there yet uh, as far as that particular technique. The reintroduction of predators to control deer numbers. Um, I hear this a lot, I read about it a lot. Um, predators aren't that fussy about what they eat. They'll eat your dog or your cat. They'll eat your kid if they want. They're easier to catch the deer. <laughs> I mean, you can't tell the predator you have to eat deer. They'll take your sheep. I mean, predators, large predators that would take down deer require a lot of space, absent of humans. So. You can imagine the number of deer we kill on the highways, and uh, you know, these predators have very large home ranges, and uh, they wouldn't last long here, even if you did try to reintroduce them. And I don't think there's a human tolerance for it. I mean, people believe they, they're tolerant until the first kid gets bit. Controlling deer with sharpshooters, again, this is another expensive, very localized solution to a problem. Uh, it's been very effective in, in some areas, so it certainly is a tool in the toolbox for biologists. But it's not a region-wide, it's not a region-wide solution. Um, right now, hunters pay the state for the privilege of going out hunting deer. So the income is coming in this way. Sharpshooters and these other programs, the money's going out the other way. We're taxed enough, it'd be hard to justify a deer tax to go out there and start shooting deer. So the last is the use of regulated hunting. And um, again, this is where hunting, not all hunting is equal. I mean, just a normal, regular hunting season can fail. And, and there's a lot of people who are against hunting who often point that out, that, well, they've been hunting this property forever, and the place still looks like hell. And that's true. Uh, but hunting can be a solution if it's done properly. So here, the program goals for for the deer management program is, is very simple. Protect the structure and function of the forest and ecosystems we have here, and to minimize conflicts with other uses of the property, which includes all the research that goes on here, uh, public programming, and so forth. 
there's three elements to, to the deer management program that are critical. And if you were to do something on your own property, I would say this is, these are the three things you want to look into. You need to know what impact you're having on your property. It doesn't take a, a, a rocket scientist to walk through your forest and determine whether or not deer are overabundant and they your landscape, number one. But what you do want to do is you want to be able to measure the effectiveness of your program. So in order to do that, you need to go back out there and, and see what the response is to the vegetation once you have implemented a program. You kind of want to have an idea, too, of what the population is doing. You know, is it going up? Is it going down? Is it staying, staying the same? That requires uh, a little bit of effort. But in our case, we use hunters to collect that information. And I'll, I'll discuss that in a minute. And then, of course, the bottom line is you have to reduce animals. You need to remove animals. So if, if your goal was to stabilize the deer population, that means anything that's recruited into that population each year has got to go away to stabilize that population. If you want to reduce that population, you need to take more than the recruitment. Okay? So for argument's sake, you have, a, you have an area with 100 does. The recruitment rate is, is 0.8 fawns per doe. So that's 80 fawns that are hitting the ground every spring and being recruited into the herd. To stabilize, 80 deer have to leave. If you want to reduce, 100 or more deer have to leave. So it's a simple way to look at it, but that's what has to happen. So we do monitor vegetation we have here for years. I use browse survey areas, plots throughout the property, and we have four deer exclosures uh, with paired on fence plots. This is the results of those surveys um, from 1997 through 2013. And really, what you're looking at, <clears throat> whoops, you're looking at year-to-year -year variability here when you see these up and down. And most of this is actually driven by how much snow cover we get in a given year. So if we, if we have 10 inches of snow, you're going to see a lower number. If we get 30 inches of snow, you're going to see a higher number. It's just that simple. But the real key is this, oops, is this right here. <clears throat> what percent of the available buds of the species you're concerned about are being consumed by deer each year? So the highest number we're looking at here is 16. That's a very low number. I don't even begin to even think twice about a concern about deer impacts until I'm well north of 30, 35%. If you get over 50%, you're likely not killing enough deer. But this is a very low number. I, you know, deer have to eat. <laughs> Whatever deer you have left, they have to eat something. Uh, so if you want deer, you're going to have to expect that they're going to be doing some browsing. So if when you look at different species, um, and, and the, we have an oak dominated forest here, but we're looking at 14% of the available buds being browsed over this period of time. That's nothing. We can sustain that very easily. Now what, you, what, what this graph doesn't show is that there are hot spots. I mean, deer select wintering areas. They select areas that are usually south, southwest facing slopes where the microclimates are favorable. Uh, they're very, very good at being uh, conservation mind in terms of energy expenditures. So deer could easily live in a room this size for weeks at a time. So you can imagine that there were half a dozen deer living in a room this size that the um, you're going to see higher browsing rates here as opposed to someplace else. Looking at our gear closures uh, very quickly, <clears throat> you want to look at the, the maroon bars here. And basically, what the maroon bars are showing is that the seedlings that are not protected by the fence are advancing in the, in the taller age classes. That, that's another good sign that things are working well in terms of it, what gear numbers you're carrying on your property. In this particular location, I showed you before, this gun club location, uh, they're, they're seeing some success inside their fences. They're seeing virtually no success outside their fences. So uh, they have some work to do. On our observations, again, this is how we, uh, we use our bow hunters to collect information on the number of deer per hour observed. And this is, again, a, a good index as to what your deer population is doing. Is it moving up? Is it moving down? Is it staying the same? Here you can see it's, it's, it's very stable. And it's, it's low, so I'm happy with that. Actual population control, this is where you get into the nuts and bolts of actually pulling deer out of the woods. Uh, the specific goals of the hunting program is to stabilize or reduce, depending on what your situation is. Achieve a younger age class and your female component because they produce fewer fawns. 
and of course, an efficient, safe hunt. In this particular case, a participation in our program is by invitation. If there's a firearms proficiency requirement, you have to demonstrate to us that you're, you prepared yourself and your firearm to, to go out there and be a, a, an efficient predator. There's an annual orientation meeting where we discuss what it is we're trying to do, how you fit into it, and what the results were from the previous season. You have to have an antlers tag in order to participate in our program. And then there's also an effort requirement. You know, Some hunters say they want to hunt, they don't get out in the woods a lot, they're just taking up space. So in our particular case, um, they need to shoot. I'm mostly interested in knowing that they took the time to get their firearm ready for the season. So they have to hit this target three or five times at 50 yards. They can stand freehand, they can shoot off the bench, it doesn't really matter. As long as I know the gun is, is sighted and do the job. Uh, we do have a sign-in, sign-out requirement, and that's really important for us because we have researchers in the field every day, so they come to a centralized check station there. We post information on the, the board where researchers will be for the day. They avoid those areas. They're required to bring your deer back to a check station. We help them do that when necessary. There is a blaze orange requirement, which is not a requirement in New York State, ridiculously. But uh, we use designated parking areas to distribute hunters across the property. You go to a parking area, it's full. Go someplace else. And then, of course, you need to avoid active research sites and restricted zones, which are safety zones around buildings. This is the check station. Every morning, the hunters come up, and they can sign in. Uh, we use a computerized sign-in system. It's easier for me to correlate data, or it was easier to keep saying this. Was uh, <clears throat> so they can come in, they can sign in. They go, they put a pin in the map, show them where they're going to go. Other hunters know where somebody else is already there. When they go to sign out, they come back and hit the sign out button. The property is divided into 26 units. They tell us where they hunted. Uh, in this particular case, this person hunted in sector 14, three and a half hours, and he can he has options to add other sectors as well. So here's the information I feed back to the hunters, trying to get them to think about their hunting activities and where it is they might hunt, might not hunt. Um, some people like the hunt areas that other hunters are using because they think deer are going to move around more. Personally, I like the hunt areas that very few people hunt. So I'm looking at areas 6, 7, you know, 13, 14, 15, those kind of areas that I like to go hunt. Other people like to hunt number 2, number 26, but to each his own. But they also get information on where the deer are harvested. So they again plan their activities. Um, this doesn't tell, I, I didn't throw a slide in here that actually broke this down to deer for 15 hours of effort. But 26 and 2, they're killing most deer there. That's where most of the effort is. Other places in here, uh, I could tell you about it, but then I'd have to shoot you. Um, <laughs> I can tell you where the, the highest uh, deer kill for 15 hours of effort is. Uh, and it's not more, or 2 of 26. <laughs> so, uh, required deer checks. So they come back to the check station with their deer. We help get it here. This is what our check station looks like. This is what a good day looks like during deer season. Um, and uh, we want them to get their does early. Does are very hard to get. Their bucks are easy to kill compared to does. Uh, these are the ones that are producing the fawns, so these are the ones we want. We also use this opportunity to collect biological data on these deer. Um, Took, took searches for other research activities and so forth. Hunters are evaluated based on their compliance with the rules and regulations, how much effort they put in. They're required to put in at least five, uh, five, uh, five, five hour days or kill a duck. So if you shoot a doe opening day, first hour, you're done. You can continue to hunt if you want, don't have to. Hunter success, you know, if you're not being successful taking does, you may not get invited back. Then of course your cooperation and attitude is important. This is a summary slide of, of 76 to 2013 in terms of the averages. So we've averaged 5,300 a year, but the ranges are in the parentheses. Over 2,000 hours of effort, 55 deer removed per year on average, and hunter success rate 66%. And you can see in the early years when deer populations were higher, that was much higher. But this is really the take home slide right here. <clears throat> you need to be killing as many does or more than the yard bucks. If you really want to get your arms around the population, this is what your, your results have got to look like. So, landowner's role in deer population management. We're a landowner. I'm assuming most of you are <coughs> landowners. You have a responsibility. We have a res stewardship responsibility. Um, you control access to resource. The deer belong to the people who stay in New York, but they reside on private land. So, 
it gets to be difficult at times to, to exercise control in an area if bunches of landowners don't want to participate. But uh, if you are interested in your ecosystem, your forest, you might want to consider providing some kind of access. And, and, and you should be proactive about it as, as opposed to, you know, a lot of landowners, uh, I'm not sure I want to get involved with that because uh, they don't know enough about it. And, and that, that's fair. Um, but there, it's your property. You get to dictate the terms in which hunting takes place. Uh, it could be bow hunting only. It could be, you know, not on weekends when I'm here. It could be, you know, not when the kids are home, whatever. You can do whatever you want because you own the land. Uh, so you customize your program as needed. Uh, but you should always require doe harvest as a requirement for access. So if anybody who wants to hunt your property, make sure they have doe tag. And you make sure they're showing up to hunt. You know, hunters, they like to collect places to hunt. And they don't often hunt all the places they have access to. So you really want people who are going to spend time on your property. And then never, ever tolerate uh, irresponsible behavior or unsafe activities. So hunters, the primary role of the hunter is to remove deer. That's their job. Go out there, take deer, bring them home. Uh, so they're the tools that managers use to get the job done. Um, but you need to keep them focused and you need to put some restrictions on them to make sure that your objectives are met. So uh, every year my hunting groups that sit in this audience and they're told every year the same thing about what's required in terms of hunting effort and the fact that they need to remove adult females to continue to be invited back. When done properly, they are providing a great service. And there are a lot of really good people out there who hunt. And um, I, know, I know sometimes people, they don't have any exposure to the hunting culture, but there are, there are a lot of very, very good people uh, who are hunters. As a hunter, we're responsible for safety. Uh, you know, you've got to be safe at all times, otherwise you'll never find a place to hunt. You've got to be respectful of landowners, you've got to be respectful of everyone and, and the property itself. Not only do you get to do things legally, but you want to have very high ethical standards. You, you, want, to, you want to go above and beyond what most people would expect. Um, never forget that access is a privilege uh, if you're a hunter. And then what you need to do is try to convince them to embrace the role they are as, as managers. As managers of a resource that is going to help themselves in the long run if forests, forests and systems or remain healthy. So the challenges for, for manage, deer managers is adequate access to the landscape scale. Again, very fragmented landscape out there in terms of ownership, not always easy to do. Sufficient numbers of antlers permits that we rely on the DEC, the state, for this. You know, they, they oscillate from year to year. You need to know for sure what you're going to get. There are programs so that we, that we uh, as a large landowner, uh, we can get extra tags to be used only on our property, so that helps. Sufficient hunter effort, that's, that's, like, that's kind of a question mark, because um, depending on who you talk to and what you read, either hunter participation is very flat or, st or still declining. Based on what I see, I see it pretty much still on a decline. So will we have enough hunters in the near future to, to actually exercise control here? Maybe not. And people just aren't doing it like they used to. Keeping them focused on uh, adult females, that, that's, that's a challenge. Uh, mostly because when you do finally get control of your deer population, hunters are going to start seeing a fewer deer. When they start seeing a fewer deer, they're unhappy. Uh, and then I have in here providing a quality hunting experience. That's really important to me and a lot of hunters. I mean, you don't want to make it too artificial. I mean, some hunting programs are very artificial. They tell you, are you going to sit in this spot? You're going to sit in that tree stand. We're going to take you out and drop you off. This is where you have to. You cannot leave that spot. That's not for me. That's not hunting. That's shooting. I prefer to hunt. So you want to keep that traditional uh, hunting uh, culture you know, as, as near normal as possible. And then there's this, this final issue here. Is there a recreational threshold? And so, and we believe, as deer managers, we believe that there is a deer density which many hunters do not see enough deer, they stop hunting. Yeah, so are they hunters or are they shooters? Anybody can shoot a deer when there's a lot of deer out there. When there's fewer deer out there, it takes a true hunter to go out there and be successful. Mm -hmm. So the problem with this, this uh, <clears throat> is that you know, they've got expectation based on time periods when deer numbers were high. 
And I've, I've experienced this myself. I've come from a time when there's a lot of deer, and now there's a lot fewer deer. I embrace the challenge. I think it's great. A lot of hunters don't. So as a consequence, that when they stop hunting, or don't hunt as much, guess what happens? Deer population goes, goes back up. So now, there's more deer. Let's go back out and hunt. So you get this up and down, up and down. So it's, it's really not good if, if your goal is for ecosystem protection. And this is the result when there's, a, when there's this burning desire or need to see more deer um, than you care about the habitat. And trying to convince a lot of folks that without habitat, no habitat, no deer. No farms, no food, no habitat, no deer. But this is a classic example of, this is a wonderful forest, or it could be a wonderful forest based on what we see inside the deer disclosure. But, um, and the real problem with these, these properties that are, that are gun club properties is that they, um, it's the politics of the club. They have such a turnover rate of leadership. Sometimes it's year to year, maybe it's every three years. And the problem is, you know, as soon as some of the hunters complain that we're not seeing enough deer, the existing leadership gets voted out of office and they bring in those who want to let deer populations go. So no more shooting does. So it's a vicious cycle. And that's, I'm, over. I'm sure I'm over my time. Take questions. Ray's going to be on that panel. Uh, he will be joined by Becky Thornton, who you heard from earlier. Uh, Tim Vonnegut, who manages the Damrack Reserve and is a sportsman and hunter of long standing. Uh, and Paul Pearson from Orvis and Nova, uh, who's uh, there, of course, our neighbor to the north here, along Route 44, uh, and well known to many of you. So if the panelists can come up. At his request. <laughs> um, so I'm sitting up there with Peggy, who manages San Anona, and I'm listening uh, to the discussion on deer uh, management. And I'm, I'm kind of breathing deeply because when I'm thinking about conservation and what we do at Orvis and what our goal is, we're restructuring habitat to try to get more animals in the more ducks, more, more trout in the streams, and, and suddenly there's this discussion about well, we got too many deer, and I'm thinking, okay, am I in my realm of where I should be? But I think the for us and what we try to do in Orvis, and this has to do with land and uh, landowners and conservation, is that um, it, it's it's remarkable when you improve that land with habitat restoration, what you can achieve uh, when it comes to bringing back species, particularly those species that we all love dearly, um, particularly the hunters. And that's where the hunters impact conservation, I think, at the, at the highest level. Like, uh, my, my first example is imagine if nobody liked ducks or geese, and imagine if all those ducks and geese were just some annoying species that were flying around. And when you look at the fact that since 1937, 
Ducks Unlimited has saved 13 or preserved 13 million acres of wetlands. Well, if nobody cared about those ducks, where would those wetlands be right now? I venture to say they'd be in either farmland or development. So, it's, and Ducks Unlimited obviously is made up mostly of hunters. So, this is kind of the direction that I come from, and uh, what we what we what we value, and what we love most, is what we tend to work to protect. So, that's kind of where where we are, and I am this discussion and uh, so if you have questions about that I'd be glad to well I guess we're kind of in the same boat we uh, we have about uh, about 3,000 acres of, of wooded land and open and, and agricultural land we think a mix is very important um, my father is very unappreciative of looking out and seeing 50 or 60 deer in a alfalfa field, which uh, they will nibble down very quickly. Uh, at the same time, uh, they do migrate into those those uh, yarding areas in the winter where they have browse and where they have water source and where they have you know, all the things that, that uh, were, were discussed. So they tend to uh, indeed over browse those areas. We actually utilize a management tool. It's a, it's a deer management permit that we get from DEC to be able to harvest deer in the in the regular season and indeed by uh, by hunters. So we get you can take animalist deer only. We get a permit for 15 deer on approximately 1,200 acres of wooded land, and we usually come pretty close to fulfilling that every year. In addition to what's taken by by the hunters, there is there are other means to control the population. Uh, there are some nuisance and, and uh, other other permits you can get. I'm uh, not very favorable towards those programs because they involve, indeed they, they do control deer populations, but the deer are not utilized. They're, they're usually thrown in a ditch somewhere and left to rot as opposed to being taken home by, by a hunter. So I, I think there does be, need to be some overhaul of the DEC's program as it faces the deer populations in this area. I've never seen as many deer as I've seen this spring. Never ever. I went by one 21 acre parcel and there were 57 deer grazing on that parcel at dusk. That's probably not all that would come there. So, so huge overabundance, even after a tough winter. Um, it seems as though the coyote population, which has been increasing, has made the deer population more healthy, not diminish the numbers. And, and this year would be a prime example when you have deep snows, the, uh, the deer break through, the coyotes run on the top, and you'd think that would be a devastating year, and yet we see more deer this spring than we've seen in any other year I can remember. So, so uh, indeed, uh, I, I think the, the use of the exclosures is a wonderful idea. We have not done that. I think we will implement that on some of the, some of the land. Um, the, uh, the hunters have been major contributors to, to conservation. I know it's sort of uh, an oxymoron, but, but uh, much of the funding for conservation has come from the sale of licenses and from other sales tax that are uh, imposed on, on recreational firearms and, and, and bows and the like. So they do play an important part. Okay, questions from the audience, uh, and I can range over the full range of uh, coverage today, and the things that you may uh, be interested in on your land that we haven't covered, like for pool protection and such. Uh, we'll try to handle that. Uh, if you want them addressed to somebody in particular, uh, say that, and, and if you speak softly, I'll try to repeat the question for everybody. In the back there. Ray, I have a question about the protected fenced areas that you did at this one particular month. At what, at what, how big of an area do you recommend? And then how long do you leave that fence up? I know that you said that there was like three to five years. Is there some point where you can take that fencing down where if those families are mature enough to survive, then you're coming through and then you can go to a new spot and fence that in? Absolutely. <clears throat> In fact, that's why I recommend with the, um, with the flexi fencing. The, the fences we have out there right now are, are metal fences. They're more permanent fences. And they're uh, 10 meters by 10 meters in size. 
what I recommend to the gun clubs is to run long linear fences as opposed to square, smaller square. Uh, 20 meter, if they can afford it, 20 meters wide and as long as they can actually, you know, can afford to do. And they can, they don't have to uh, sink a lot of posts in the ground, they can use trees for fence posts and they just temporarily attach that. And that'll, um, depends on what's in the understory. I mean, if you have a good seedling uh, cohort sitting in the understory that's ready to take off once you relieve the deer pressure, yeah, it, it, as quickly as five years, you can move that fence to another part of the property because you will see, you know, easily two meters of growth in, in a lot of those streets. And I imagine that doesn't infringe on any because we're part of a, a national like a forest forestry program uh, where they come in and help us forest, and that would infringe on that. Do you think in any way? I'm not familiar with uh, with the program, uh, with the requirements of the, of the yeah, program, but I can't imagine it would because you're you're basically trying to regenerate forest. Uh, everybody wants to know how many deer there are out there, and there is no answer to that question, because whatever I tell you now is going to change five minutes from now. Um, so it's really relative. You know, what, what are the impacts deer are having on your property, and then you determine whether you have too many deer, just enough deer, or too few deer. So by measuring impacts to vegetation, you come up with a, a comfort level of, yeah, we're doing okay. When you see browsing rates that are consistently below 20% year after year after year, you know you're not carrying too many deer. When you get to the point where you're seeing 50% of the available buds are being browsed, then you start getting concerned and you, you know you want to take, take more deer. But it's, you know, we're an unfenced property. Um, there's just no way of knowing. Uh, I mean, people, you could spend an awful lot of money trying to figure out how many deer there are out there and, and never come up with the right answer. And, and again, the answer changes every day. So it's, it's really, you know, what the deer are doing to your property. That's, that's the question you should be asking. So in effect, you're happy with the notion of removing on balance on average 55 year and deer. Well, we're actually removing fewer deer than that right now. I mean, that's the average over...